sorry. All right, so remember we talked about the fact that the um, that marketing orientation means that we look to the world and we figure out a problem that's out there rather than we um, make something that we think is cool and then try to convince other people to, to purchase it or to buy it, but rather marketing the marketing concept marketing orientation is that the world or the marketplace needs certain things and we organize in ways that satisfy that need and we do it in a way that creates value for all parties meaning that the market does better people buying it feel like they're getting something worthwhile to them otherwise they wouldn't pay for it the value to them is enough that the pricing comes in and allows us to hire people and pay suppliers and all that where everyone there is satisfied that they're getting paid pretty well. And then the investors that are putting their money at risk likewise get the benefit and the value from, um, from the activities of the organization. So it's sort of flipping it around how we might think about business is pushing hamburgers out the door, a Wendy's being something that generates hamburgers to push out the door. To a business that says Wendy's is in the business of satisfying people's needs for a fast lunch. They want a fast lunch, they like hamburgers, so you're satisfying that need. And what you're trying to do when you improve your product or change your product is understand how those needs change, understand how you can better satisfy their needs, and in that particular case, that's how you would grow. That's the logic. So how do we put a strategy, a marketing strategy together? That becomes one of the key challenges. Really. How do you actually do this? Figure out what people want, do certain things with them, whatever. Well, the first thing that you have to figure out is what is the market that you're going after? Who is it that you're going to try to understand and understand their needs and supply them? Because one of the things I think all of us know, have come to know, have come to learn eventually as we grow up, is that people have different desires, different needs, they're different. There's a lot of things that are the same, but there's also a lot of differentiated um, activities. Some people like sports, other people couldn't be bothered. Some people like performance art, other people couldn't be bothered, right? So the first thing you want to do is not say, we're making something and we want to satisfy everyone's needs. You say, there's a, there's a category of people out there, a group of people, a collection, we call it a segment, of the market, of people, a group that you could put together in a box and say all these people have one thing in common. And let's use the sports analogy. The one thing they have in common is that they really like the New York Rangers, all right, hockey team. That's what they have in common. Okay, what are the needs of that market segment, right? So our target market now becomes people that are fans of the New York Rangers. So they like hockey, they like sports, those various kinds of things. Um, yes, Pooja, did you want to, oh, we haven't quite got to marketing mix yet. Okay, <laughs> so we'll get to that, all right? Let's stay on, uh, I, uh, uh, it's one of the concepts we'll talk about a little bit later, all right? Um, what you're trying to do is, Pooja, would you, you want to put your hand down or did you have another question you could type in? Okay. All right, we'll get to marketing mix. Um, so you select the, the Rangers and you say, okay, how do we um, address that issue? Who are these people? What do they want? Uh, they like hockey. Um, they're typically more male than female. There's a certain age group, a certain demographic. Um, they certainly live on Long Island, largely, or in New York. They're not from, some might be in Philadelphia or whatever, but by and large, uh, you can identify attributes of those people that are different than other people. And that's your, um, that's your, that's the idea of, uh, of identifying the people that you're trying to get at, identifying your target market. Once you do that, that's when you start to say to yourself, okay, how is it? that we come up with a plan that mixes the various elements of what your marketing strategy is, the marketing mix, to get to Pooja's question, of how we go about developing and identifying what sort of products you're gonna offer, what sort of uh, placements you're gonna play, put in place, uh, you know, how you're gonna put it, 
put various products in stores and the like. <clears throat> um, all of those items, how do you put the story together? And we'll talk more about the marketing mix in a few minutes. But the marketing strategy is figuring out who the people are you're going to sell, and then the marketing mix being all these activities that have to come together. It's more specific than that, but that's, a, that's how we start, um, start the discussion. So let's talk more about that in details. How do we describe a target market? What is a target market? Well, that's the group of people, as I said, that are the ones that you think have a need, keeping in mind this market orientation, they have a need that you're going to try to satisfy. You can't satisfy everybody's needs. You can't satisfy the needs of a Pittsburgh Penguin fan. Maybe their hockey stuff, but not necessarily their fanness. But you can't satisfy the needs of a New York Rangers fan. Okay? So that's where you say this is the target market that we're going after. This is what we're going to try to, <clears throat> to address. And so you identify those people. You start to talk to them. You start to learn about what they want, what they need, um, how their life could be easier and better. And you start to develop a relationship with them where you give them the things that they will ultimately need in order to be, um, to be satisfied with what it is that they're, uh, that, that they're, it allows them to realize their New York Ranger fanness. Okay. So let's talk about different ways to think about a target market. There's the total market approach where you say, we're gonna to try to sell a product that as many people will buy as possible, right? And then there's the, very, the, the segmentation approach. This is where you say to yourself, we're going to identify a very small niche in the market and we're going to try to, to, to satisfy that particular segment. The general market approach would you say it might sell to, to all sports fans, certain kind of sporting equipment or whatever, um, but a narrow niche might be what I was saying before is you go after the New York Rangers fan. That's the segment you want. Interestingly enough, <clears throat> you start selling to the New York Rangers segment. You may also have a very similar set of products that you can then create to start selling it, start, start selling, it uh, selling products to the Pittsburgh Penguin or the, the, the um, uh, Boston uh, marketplace for, for hockey, or you may expand out to other segments. And we'll talk about multiple segments in a moment. A couple things to keep in mind that women are the largest market segment. So many products are marketed to women and not so much to men or to men and not so much to women. That's a segmentation, right? It's not selling to everybody. And then there's various um, kind of historic or cultural demographics like Hispanics. There's sports, there's all sorts of others, and we'll talk about several of those in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, but here's the idea of the target markets. You could try to sell something to as broad a marketplace as you want, which typically means that you're um, creating something that, has a, that, that there is a broad need for. Commodities are a classic case of this. Lots of people need an automobile, so you might sell a general automobile to sell to a large market as you can. Less number of people want a convertible, sporty convertible that, um, that can get up to 300 or 200 miles an hour on the highway. Um, that's a narrower segment, so you might break it down and sell to a single target market with a sports car, or as Elon Musk is doing uh, with the Tesla, selling to affluent, because the cars are expensive, affluent, but also energy conscious or environmentally conscious individuals, a very small segment that you're creating cars for, right? That's a single segment. Larger fir firms, one way to expand is to try to grow your segment. We were using the Rangers before, try to sell more and more products to Rangers fans. <clears throat> but you might also then say, I'm going to start making products for Pittsburgh Penguins fans or um, uh, Philadelphia Flyers fans. I don't know all that many hockey teams, so I'm running out here. But that you then do that so you're selling to multiple segments. Each one of them is very focused on the needs of a, of a Philadelphia Flyer fan. They like they have Flyer logos and Flyer uh, uh, numbers that are that are popular and all that sort of thing. But they're still being marketed as segments, but there's multiple segments. This is a really important concept because when um, I teach entrepreneurship classes and like, excuse me for one second, I need a cup of coffee, a sip of coffee. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, that, that oftentimes people just think we're going to make something and then open it up and put it on the internet or sell it 
um, you know, put a stand out and sell it and people will walk by and buy it. Um, that is sort of not, that's the, not the marketing concept. That's sort of the old way is, I think this is a cool thing to make. I'm going to make it and see who buys it. That's, um, that is a general market play, but for a small company, it's very hard to get attention in that kind of a model. Finding a segment and understanding their needs better than anyone else is a much more high, high probability success model because you then have an opportunity to understand that segment better than anyone else. There aren't that many large organizations that are trying to understand precisely what ranger, college age ranger fans who live and go to school in Long Island, what those people want for, uh, for products and services. There aren't that many people that are focusing on that. And so you could become the expert in that area, and that's how you develop a niche and you start selling products and, and the like for that, in that sort of a mindset or that sort of a model. So that's the notion of, um, of whether to target market segments or broad, more broadly the whole market or multiple segments. But how do we figure out what, what market segmentation we want to develop? Segmenting the market. The easy thing I mentioned, Ranger fans, Flyers fans. Or penguin fans, or you can say um, men and women, older, younger, Hispanic, um, African American. You have different kinds of ways to describe market niches, um, but there are also others, and this is one of the main areas um, that marketing works on: is understanding and naming, naming for the purposes of marketing messaging, different groups. There's terms you've heard, millennials, generation Y, generation X. You've heard of the baby boomers. These names came because marketing groups that segment marketplace have identified these as groups that have common purchasing and buying habits. Millennials come of age after the, after the um, millennium are also much more aware of terrorism and those kinds of risks, or they grew up with it, it's always been around, and so therefore there are different sorts of psycho, psychosocial activities that are going on and different buying behaviors and buying habits, okay? So that's what people go after. There's a whole industry along these lines. It's very interesting psychology, and there's lots of possible opportunities. Essentially, when people think about segmenting, they break it down into these various categories. There's demographics, your age. I mentioned those millennials, Generation Y, Generation X, and others. There's geographic. We sort of touched on that with the hockey store. Somebody, in, somebody that's a hockey fan would have different interests if you live on Long Island than if you live in Philadelphia or if you live in Boston or if you live in Detroit. You have different um, desires specific, at the specific level. You can have different needs. But that's also true for restaurants. A restaurant is located in a particular place. If it doesn't have multiple locations, so the, the segment that they're after is people that can drive to that restaurant. So that's a geographic segmentation. There's also what are called psychographic, which is the kind of behavior characteristics people have, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, and behavioristic. In other words, what people do. That is, there are people that are fans of sports, and there are people that participate or play the sport. People that play hockey versus that go to the go to the games and like to wear the jerseys and like those people are actually different segments when you think about it because they have different needs they buy different products they they want to be um, to have their needs satisfied in different ways so there's different kinds of behavioral characteristics. Um, we we could talk about the marketing mix in terms of how you actually decide on the activities that you need to develop and orchestrate in order to meet the marketplace need. You have a segment, you've identified the range of fans, you're, they're fans, not necessarily participants, although they can also be part of this. Um, they live on Long Island and they go to college, right? What are the products those people want? What is it that, that you could manufacture, put on the shelves that, that people would want for those kinds of situations? Well, there's products, there's services, perhaps there's trips to the stadium, there's discounted tickets, there's season tickets, you might have jerseys, you might have um, pennants, you might have uh, masks or anything like that that people might want to wear. Um, there's all sorts of possible products that you could develop. 
price, you have to decide on whether or not you make premium prices, you sell them very expensive. Is, it, is this a jersey that has someone's name on it that is, um, that is a star, that actually has an endorsement that causes a licensing cost associated with it, relatively expensive pricing, or is this something that is a generic jersey or something that's just a t-shirt that has the name of the Rangers on it? Jerseys, you have to pay back licensing fees to the NHL, so there's a more higher price, whereas just a t-shirt, depending upon how it's structured, if it violates or has any trademark issues, there might be some licensing. But other than that, it's possible to just have I Love Hockey or something like that, which does not have a, um, a licensing fee, in which case you could have a lower price, right? So you have to figure out where you're going to be, which, what you're the, the needs of your particular clientele are. If they're affluent, if you're going after the affluent segment of college students, whatever, then you have the price where you have all of these uh, unique uh, jerseys that are manufactured very, very finely, and they have light licensing fees because not only the, the uh, NHL, but perhaps the player, um, all sorts of possibilities. If you're going after a, a, a more working class segment, perhaps you might then not be selling those kind of products, you sell some other sort of thing. So those are sort of, those are the, the things to consider as well. Distribution is where do you put these things? Where do people buy them? Do they buy them off the internet? Do you try to put them in Walmart or do you try to put them in, in sporting goods stores? Or do you try to put them in specialty stores like an NHL store? Where do you place them? That's what distribution is all about. How do you actually put them in a position where, where those people in your segment can find them, decide they want to purchase them, purchase them, and then they, the retail outlet gets their money and then it goes back through the, the channel to you who's made that product or service. Um, in the, the product, the marketing mix is often called the four P's. And the fourth P, it says distribution here. That's why they don't say four P's here. But placement is what they mean by the fourth P, which is sort of like distribution. Distribution is a little bigger because it includes warehousing and all that. But are you placing your Rangers jerseys in Walmart for people to purchase them? Are you doing it in just Long Island? Or are you doing it in the Walmart only near the college because that's the target market? Are you placing them in all Walmarts all over Long Island? Are you placing them in Walmarts in Philadelphia when the Rangers are playing Philadelphia? Only during that weekend or that time the series is there. Are you placing them in, you know, like Models or Dick's Sporting Goods? Are you placing them there? Are you placing them at the stadium? Maybe there's a cart that's outside that you lease the space to sell your jerseys at the stadium before the event. That's what the distribution piece is about. And then promotion is what we often would say, advertisement, special deals, buy two for one. You get one jersey, you get another one free, that kind of thing. How are you going to induce people to make their purchase at that particular point in time? Advertising, when there's a Rangers, the Rangers are coming, the Rangers are at home. The home game, how do you promote them? You might have, uh, uh, have the jersey on TV. You may get somebody that's a celebrity to wear one of your jerseys. That's that sort of thing. Those are the promotions. So how do you put all of these marketing activities together? This is the marketing mix. How do you put all of these together in order to make sure that the segment that you are targeting is aware of your product? That's the promotion. That the product meets their needs, that's the product, specific needs there, you know, what it does and how it, it, it shows they're a Ranger fan or whatever. Um, that's when someone wears, a, wears something like a Ranger jersey to a stadium. That's called, in marketing, they call that identity signaling, which means that you're signaling to everyone else that you're a Rangers fan by wearing a Rangers jersey. That's what that process means and so you and there's a contagion associated with that if other people everyone wears them then everyone feels like they're part of an identity everyone signals and there's a lot of of uh, of stress or pressure on others to participate as fans under that scenario what do you how do you figure out your pricing is the price does your segment can actually afford the product that you're offering which meets their needs and that you're promoting and then the last one with the placement or distribution they know about it, it's the right product, they have the right price, but the shelves are empty, right? You haven't stocked enough, you don't have the right distribution strategy, okay? So all of those pieces come together and there are jobs in each and every one of those areas.
which is one of the things that makes market so marketing so interesting. Then we have the whole notion of market research. In order to do all of these, these four aspects of the marketing mix, um, in order to target your market, you have to understand what people want and, and how those, how they, what their buying behavior is, uh, what's, their, what's some of their triggers and all of that. And that's what marketing research is about. Systematically trying to figure out what it is that people want, what are their characteristics, what makes groups similar in their buying behavior, and what messages that you might send them in your promotion or your advertising, what messages they will respond to and go out and purchase the product or service. That's the whole notion of marketing research. Um, the, uh, the, this, there's two kinds of marketing uh, research to consider. The first is called primary data. That's the sort of information that you can gather whenever you're, that's the information that you can gather whenever uh, you are actually talking to customers, meeting with them, doing surveys, any of those sorts of things. Um, and secondary data is the kind of information that you might get whenever you're, um, uh, whenever you get it off the internet or you get a report from somebody else, those, those kinds of things are what one would call, uh, one would decide or consider to be secondary data. Both of them are important. Secondary data does not distinguish you from anyone else because you've gotten stuff that's available on the internet or from, from agencies that do the research. But it gives you a lot of background information about demographics and and the people's, uh, what other people feel like there's this, the general segments are. Um, so you need to do it, and it's very important. But primary data is what you gather yourself that you own, and so you can be exclusive in having access to that data, which means you may know some things that other people are unable to, uh, to deal with, right? So that, that is the one that allows you to create the product and services service that is unique and distinct from other people because you understand something, you potentially understand something about your customers that other people just do not have or cannot do. As I mentioned, secondary research is like online marketing. There's, uh, there's ways to get data. You, you can download information about them. You could search old history and things like that. But you can also do primary research online because there's different kinds of uh, survey systems like SurveyMonkey and others that you can, for a reasonable fee, and in some cases for small survey, actually no charge, you can set up surveys and, um, and get customers to answer certain questions for you. Um, there's all sorts of ways to gather marketing data, and that's one of the areas that you, you can explore. And there are jobs that are really totally focused around this notion of market research and not necessarily going out and talking to customers or whatever, but figuring out how you do surveys, how you construct surveys, how you organize them, how you gather the data, um, all of those uh, various portions or pieces of the, of the storyline. Um, the next uh, area that people explore is the, the buying behavior of individuals. And this is the... Um, this is part of the segmentation, which is how do people actually make their decision to purchase? What are some of the drivers that people, in, that people might have that would cause them to pick your product off the shelf rather than someone else? And how do those, uh, those pieces of, fit together? Uh, that's another area that, that marketing people sort of worry about or try to understand better. And in fact, you try to figure out how you could influence someone to make a purchasing decision or a buying decision. One of the things that, that this is in marketing uh, terms, this is often called the trigger, something that would cause you to say, ah, gee, I need that product, let me go purchase it. There's uh, been a recent uh, new product offering by Amazon, which is, a, um, uh, which is essentially an electronic button that you can put in your house. This is only under alpha test. Uh, but you'll probably see it in um, more more broadly um, over the next uh, several months or years. Uh, but it's a button that you can put in your house that hooks up wirelessly to the internet, 
And like for example, and one it, the button allows you to buy one thing. So you'd put one by your washing machine or your dryer in your, in your laundry room. And when you see you're running out of laundry detergent, you would press this button. And that button would purchase uh, more laundry detergent for you. Now, information technology allows this because it goes through Amazon. What happens is you press the button, it goes in, it sees what the laundry detergent you buy is, what your normal quantity is, and then it produces the order and then sends you a text on your phone and then you can say, yes, I want to buy that. Boom, and you hit the button and you purchase the laundry detergent, which then gets shipped to you um, in your next order. This is the sort of thing that, that Amazon is working on. And as you can see, what it does is it allows someone to buy something when it occurs to them that they need to purchase this thing and that they need to move forward with that, um, with that idea. Um, so that's what that's the sort of notion of buying behavior and what people are trying to do. There are many different variables psychologically associated with purchasing behavior. One is what is the perception of the product? Um, how does the person see the product? How does the person respond to their environment? What are the information they have? What do they perceive that they may or indeed purchase? What catches their attention, if you will? Um, that may be the color of the product, that may be the design or shape of the product. That's one of the things that is uh, that Apple is particularly strong at. There's a sort of an Apple look, things that are Apple look like Apple things. Um, it's one of the reasons, as I was saying, people will be purchasing, I predict, the Apple Watch because it looks like an Apple. It looks like an Apple iPhone and it looks like an Apple iPad and an iPad and it looks like an Apple um, Watch, right? It's not any electronic watch or just any watch, it's an Apple watch, so uh, there's this perception, it catches your attention. What is their motivation? What causes a person to buy? Are they motivated by price? Are they motivated to buy something that everything else has? Is there this identity signaling? They want to buy something that signals an identity. That's the a Apple thing, right? I'm an Apple person, I love Apple, uh, so I buy an Apple watch, right? That signals to people that I'm part of this tribe of Apple people, Apple users. Um, then there's learning. How do, you, how do people learn how the process works and that sort of thing? Um, how do they understand how this will help them? Not every product that's announced, like the Apple Watch, do people immediately intuitively know how they're going to use it. So there might be some training associated with that or some learning that causes people to be comfortable with the purchase or not. Um, they might have positive or negative feelings about certain things. Like hockey, for example, some people just have a visceral love for the game. Others have a visceral uh, reaction to the violence of the game, right? So what is their general attitude to that, that, the, those kinds of attitudes, that, that, those kinds of attributes? Understanding people helps you to determine what segment they're in, right? Which type of, are they a person that will go to the hockey games or not, even though demographically, ethnically, um, in terms of uh, perhaps other aspects of their personality, they match, they may have a different attitudinal difference with respect to their buying behavior. And then, of course, personality, different things cause different types of behaviors, um, introversion, and extroversion, the desire for achievement, there are different um, kinds of psychological variables that play into this thing. There's also studying of dividing people, segmenting people, understanding how they act as consumers that relate to how people are and behave socially. One of them is their social role. As a student, you might purchase certain things. You're much more likely to purchase or rent a textbook than somebody, the average person on the streets of New York, right? Because of your role as a student. Other people are much more likely to buy a high-end automobile if they have to meet customers. If I have to drive around and meet customers all the time, then I have a high-end, I would purchase a high-end automobile just because I need to be, I can be signaling my status as I talk to people in various kinds of roles. Also, there's the reference group that is, who do I feel like I'm part of? Who am I like? I, I might buy products and services that other people that I, I consider related to my identity have the same kind of, they're signaling their identity through the products and services they buy. I want to resonate with that signal, so I buy similar products and services. 
I dress in a similar way. I wear my hair in a similar way. I, so that's a service that you get when you get your, your hair um, taken care of. Um, various kinds of process, processes like that. Also social class, certain things are purchased and others aren't, depending upon your class and what kind of cultural environment you are, what kind of food you eat. Do you like, uh, if you're uh, Chinese, do you like to have uh, homemade Chinese food? Um, can you tolerate some of the Chinese food in the United States in, in terms of uh, situations like that? Um, other people like different kinds of, uh, of dress, depending upon what their cultural, historical environment is all about. These are the social behaviors. What this means is you can take somebody that's the same, woman in her 40s, um, living in New York City, and even though these women might be the same, on those variables, they divide up differently on the social roles. Or they might have the same personality or the same buying, the same personal behaviors we described before, but because one is in a, one social class and someone is in another social class, they're going to have different purchasing behaviors. And so they're in different segments. And you want to understand how you kind of break up the entire population and then find that demographic, geographic, personality behavior, social behavior, social roles, and that collection of people, if you can find out what their common needs are, then you have a market for your product or service. And that's the whole story behind um, building up a market research plan. External forces impact people as well. Legal, how big the environment is right now, there are people are wondering why consumption has been lower because there's still overhang from the financial crisis a few years back and as people aren't feeling as comfortable spending their money. Even though oil prices went down, people's consumer consumption behaviors did not go up as fast as some economists suspected because of some of these outside influences. People were just a little, they'd rather hold on to their money for a little while. Also inflation, if inflation is going up, that would cause people to purchase the product because they're afraid it's gonna be more expensive in the future. If they think the price will be the same tomorrow, why not wait till tomorrow, right? So you have to understand this macro environment as well as all of these individual items to determine what the market environment is all about. So you can see that when you look at this marketing mix, not only do you have to do product, price, placement or distribution and promotion for the customer. You also have to understand the outside social forces, political environment, technological forces, marketing environment, competitive and economic forces, all of those things, and have a continual plan revisiting, revising, improving your marketing mix for the various segments, if you're going after multiple segments, and developing your marketing strategy. This is what the marketing storyline is all about. My marketing is, is a profession, it's a career, it's something that you can, like customers, specialize in pricing. There are jobs that are just pricing modeling and how you do pricing. There's product, product modeling. There's promotion, just advertising, copywriting, social media advertising, social media promotion. Jobs, careers, entire departments, organizations, consulting firm, firms that specialize in each of these various areas. So marketing is a huge operation. There's many good jobs there. It can be very exciting and interesting um, because it's about we as human beings. It's about us as human beings, how we think, what we do, all of that sort of thing, which makes it um, can be a, a very exciting. Sometimes people that do marketing come across as just you know, trying to push things and sell things to people. But there is a flip side of that, which is you're trying to make people's lives better. You're trying to design products and services that make their lives better. It's what they want. You give them what they want. You try to make things better for them. You put, you price it at the place they can, they, they like the price. You tell them about it through your messaging and promotion. You make sure that it's available to them through your distribution channel and placement strategies, either via the internet or delivery online or in a store, um, however you do it. And you make sure that it lays out or understand or it's in the context of the environment and you make people's lives better. And that's one way to think about marketing, which is a much more positive perspective than, um, than just pushing things or convincing people to buy stuff that they don't really need uh, money for.
So you can see the marketing is imp is important not only for making money, but even nonprofit or even marketing government programs. Um, any of this, all of this, when you think about it in a broader perspective of services, what services do people need? What kind of support do they need? What kind of education do they need? Understanding what people's needs are across these various segments and demographics and then tailoring various services for each of those. It's the same kind of model, figuring out what it is people need in their specific circumstance, who they specifically are and then developing and designing a service, making sure they have access to it and they can afford it, that meets that need and does it in a way that everybody wins. That's kind of the, um, the marketing story. I'm gonna wind up there for today, uh, even though we have a little bit extra time, um, just because we do have for, uh, for many of us or some of us, the Christians, a holiday weekend. So we'll wrap that up. Um, we'll wrap up a little bit early today. Are there any questions? that I can take. And if you want to hang on for a little while, I'll be here and you could ask any questions you want or we can have some chat. Um, or otherwise, um, those of you that are celebrating Easter this weekend, I hope you have a happy Easter. And we will talk to you all on Monday. Okay. And I'll be here if anyone has any questions you'd like to talk.